So welcome to the session on uh, biodiversity, ecosystems, and uh, geodiversity. Uh, we start now. We have uh, first a few uh, longer presentations on specific initiatives. Then uh, my name is Antonello Provenzale, and I'm organizing this session together with uh, Gael Le Boulet. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a few slightly longer presentations first, and then a, a series of uh, panel discussions. Uh, some panel discussions more on the role of infrastructures, other on specific uh, themes. So the first presentation we have is on the activity of uh, GeoBon, and it's given by Enrique Pereira, who is in remote now. Uh, each presentation will be seven minutes at most, plus three minutes for questions. But those in the panel discussion will be much shorter. Uh, and I ask all the speakers to be to stay uh, on time. Uh, can we open the connection? Yeah, I I think we I can start. Can you uh, hear me? Okay, ciao Enrique, then the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you, Al. Um, so I, um, first apologies that I, I was not able to make it uh, there. Um, I've been uh, hearing a lot of good things about the, the meeting and um, um, there is a lot of excitement um, coming through the, let's say, social media about the meeting, what is really wonderful. Now, um, I was asked to say a few words about where Geobon is heading, but I mainly would speak it from the perspective of, of uh, Europa Bon. And um, I wanted to start by saying that we, we have this paradox, it's, it's been called the biodiversity conservation paradox. At the same time, some studies have shown no, no trends in local species richness uh, when analysis are done globally. On the other hand, we um, all are aware that extinction rates have been accelerating over the last few um, centuries and, and particularly uh, over the last few decades. And uh, one reason for this conservation, biodiversity conservation paradox is that the biodiversity monitoring data that we have is just not good enough to answer questions about global biodiversity, biodiversity change. We have just carried out an analysis um, earlier this year in ecography where we did this thought experiment of how many sites you'll need to um, monitor biodiversity to find a significant trend. And we found that you, know, you needed a few thousand sites if they were randomly distributed uh, um, around the world. The problem is that such a network doesn't exist. Uh, we don't have a randomly or a homogeneous network of sites. We have a lot of bi special bias, but may even uh, lead to detection of false positive trends uh, if we if you have this kind of analysis. So this is the problem. And the problem is, has been known for uh, many years. And uh, in 2015, uh, I and David Cooper, that curiously is now the acting executive secretary of, of the Convention on Biological Diversity published a little um, comment on, on in trees saying we needed the global biodiversity uh, change system and monitoring uh, system. And uh, um, then GeoBone was established. Um, and one of the major developments was, of course, the idea of the essential biodiversity variables. What will be the variables that we needed to monitor globally? Um, to uh, have a good understanding of biodiversity change. And I must say that over the last 15 years, we came a long way because when the coming Montreal biodiversity framework um, for biodiversity was approved, it was approved with something called the monitoring framework for the coming Montreal global biodiversity framework. And this monitoring framework highlights a few indicators that needs to that need to be developed to assess the progress. So there's an increasing uh, um, perception, awareness that we need much better biodiversity monitoring globally. And very, very recently, um, uh, Andy, that is Andy Gonzalez is currently the co-chair together with the uh, um, 
uh, Kosher of Jubon, uh, together with uh, several other authors, uh, came again with this idea that we need the global biodiversity observation system uh, designed around national biodiversity observation networks that will monitor the different EBVs and it will be kind of federated globally. And um, fortunately in Europe, we are having a head start on this because Europe, uh, the European Commission funded Europa Bond um, uh, about three years ago as a, uh, a coordination of support action that is exactly de designing an European biodiversity monitoring system um, as a contribution, in, among other things, to such a global biodiversity observation system. And it's being done around, um, this design is being done around essential biodiversity variables. I won't have time to um, go into a lot of details about Europa Bonn uh, today, but I just wanted to say that um, if you'd like to engage with Europa Bonn, uh, there is a, a, a member's web page. If anyone can engage, you'll get uh, all the results uh, from our, our work and um, uh, invitations for consultations, stakeholder consultations and so on. And all of our results um, are available as a real collection um, that you can access through the Europa Bonn website. And thank you. Thank you very much, Erika. Thanks. Uh, so we have uh, time for some comments or questions, if there are any. Uh, Europa Bond is a very important uh, European uh, initiative, and I think we should all uh, be linked to it in some ways. Uh, are there comments? Please. Um, sorry, I missed what you were observing. Are you looking at presence and absence? Are you looking at abundance? Are you looking at seasonality? Or do you specify any of these things? Or is it whatever people want to look for? So, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I have to really to be very short in the presentation. There is one of the things, one of the main deliverables is the list of variables that should be observed. And we use the social biodiversity variable framework. So there is six classes of variables from the genetic level to ecosystem function. And uh, there is several variables that are about species presence absences for a few taxonomic groups. So it's not all taxonomic groups. We, we have chosen a few taxonomic groups, many of them linked to the uh, habitats and birds directives, but also outside uh, those, let's say, uh, required monitoring um, that we have now in Europe and for the groups that are for the species that are in those on those directives. Okay. Do you, if you go to the web for to the Europa Bond website, uh, you can go to the deliverable that has around 70 variables that we propose for monitoring at the European level, and you can know exactly which, which species are, are being proposed to be monitored. Okay, and does that include sample effort? Because without that, you tend to get a bit confused in with the results. No, no, the, uh, uh, we are designing a system. And um, for some of these species, there is already ongoing monitor that gives us a good uh, understanding. We have also an assessment of how good is this monitoring. So there is another deliverable that tells you for each of this, these variables how, how good and how far are we from having a good sampling effort. For many of them, we are very far from having a good sampling effort. And uh, we are proposing a new network of sites to monitor, um, to monitor those many variables that are still under under monitored. Thank you. Other comments, questions? If not, thank you very much, Enrique. We continue with the next presentation. Is Sara Venturini from from uh, Geo Secretariat on the Global Ecosystems Atlas. Thank you, Antonello, and I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the Geo Secretariat. Um, as some of you might know, uh, we are the central secretariat based in Geneva, and um, I'm here today to present you the, the newest Geo 
uh, global collaboration that is designed um, in the spirit of the post-2025 um, strategy. So as Enrique said really well, uh, we have a data problem. Uh, the, there is a need, urgent need to respond to the biodiversity crisis and achieve the, the goals and targets of the global biodiversity framework. But the information um, in technology are available, but uh, existing data are inconsistent, they are incomplete or widely dispersed. So there is a need for a common reference framework for reporting on ecosystems and um, that facilitates um, harmonized and coherent regional, uh, national, global reporting of the state of ecosystems. So for this reason, GEO is building a, an unprecedented uh, network of partners and uh, on existing GEO initiatives as well as initiatives beyond GEO to create the first ever global ecosystems atlas. The secretariats of the Convention on Biodiversity, the Convention on um, Combating Desertification, the Convention on Climate Change, and the Ramsar Convention on uh, Wetlands have all offered their endorsement and support to the initiative and the concept of the Global Ecosystem Atlas. So we, we start with that and we are um, essentially building this initiative as a major collaborative effort and you can see the key partners that are involved so far and um, this is part of the new incubators approach that GEO is embracing under the post 2025 strategy and we have been convening meetings several meetings since last year the most recent ones are in May in Geneva and in September also in Switzerland and um, these have been complemented by a number of engagement um, opportunities with geo initiatives, with international organizations to develop partnerships, to leverage existing investments and, and avoid duplication. So the Atlas, as I said, will be building on a number of substantive initiatives like the Global Forest Watch, Global Mangrove Watch, Alan Coral Atlas, um, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative, NICFI, and a number of others. And of course, GeoBon Global Biodiversity Observing System, GBIOS. And we see these are as complementary initiatives uh, where the Atlas serves as, a, as an umbrella for, for monitoring and various elements, various components uh, can feed into that and vice versa. The Atlas can also feed into other initiatives such as the um, Emerging Global Knowledge Support Service for Biodiversity being um, funded by UNEP WCMC. So what have been doing so far, um, we are now in the co-design phase. A number of partners, as I said, have been convened and we have been agreeing on the main features of the Atlas. So the Atlas, as I said, will offer the best information on ecosystem extent, condition, services, risks, and vulnerability through an explorable user interface and, and which will be constantly curated over time. It's not meant to be a three, five year project, it's meant to be a longer term initiative and sustained with uh, necessary funding and infrastructure. <clears throat> and the objectives are to support global assessments, to support countries in the development of their national maps for reporting and accounting, and also to enable businesses and financial institutions to, to assess their nature-related risks. Uh, that is uh, an emerging voluntary um, requirement. So uh, the Atlas will build on a number of um, of phases and deliverables. The first um, phase will be the compilation and curation of existing maps of ecosystem types that are going to be vetted, that are going to be um, merged to create an integrated synthesis map of ecosystems aligned to the uh, IUCN Global Ecosystems Typology, GET. And all those data products will be hosted on a platform with certain functionalities, 
to support uh, content access and certain al analytics that will be developed according to the needs. And finally, there will be a component of uptake and capacity building, of course, for um, the target users to create their own maps and utilize the, the functionalities. And so, like I said, the primary users will be governments and countries to use um, the Atlas for to fulfill their reporting obligations under the Global Biodiversity Framework. For instance, the Atlas can help um, facilitate country reporting on the main indicators on the red list of ecosystem, extent of natural ecosystem, services provided by ecosystems, and so on. And this user-friendly uh, um, interface will facilitate that, but users will also have the possibility to integrate their own data, uh, national earth observation information from remote sensing, from in-situ data, from citizen science, and so on, which is one of the unique features of the Atlas. So it will be continuously um, evolving. And uh, we're also targeting corporates and financial institutions to comply this, with these voluntary reporting frameworks. And, um, and this is also something new that hasn't been done before. Obviously, the, the research community and academia will be both users and contributors to the Atlas. And we have um, a series of opportunities to continue engaging with partners and governments for, for the co-design phase for awareness raising of this initiative so that people can join uh, for political buy-in, but also financial commitments, which we need to quick kickstart the initiative. And of course, for developing and validating the, the, the use cases. So the key events will be next week. In fact, uh, the GeoBorn conference will have a dedicated session on the Atlas to present to the broad community that is necessarily uh, the, the, the right community of experts um, to um, support this concept. There will be also a dedicated session at Geo Week uh, in Cape Town. Uh, as you might remember, Geo Week this year is a summit, ministerial summit, and where ministers of Geo member states will be uh, essentially um, receiving the, the new post-2025 strategy for endorsement, and the strategy will start in 2025. And the hallmark for this strategy is the empowerment of all stakeholders to use Earth intelligence. And in fact, there will be a dedicated session on the Atlas to present this particular showcase, and we expect uh, financial commitments and pledges by our member countries to support the Atlas. And of course, involvement of partners to support the initiative. Then we will have UNFCCC COP28, where we will have a number of side events, including the first data visualization, the first story to visualize what the Atlas could look like. And finally, um, next year, we aim for um, COP16 uh, of the UNCCD to present the first beta version of the Atlas uh, with side events and, and partnerships. So stay tuned, the opportunity is open for the Eurogeo community members to participate, to get involved, and uh, come talk to the Geo Secretariat for, for more information. I'll be here and happy to respond to your questions. Thank you. Questions, comments? This is another crucial initiative, in fact. Oh. Europe, please. Not only of Europe, so global. Yeah, it's um, more of a comment, comment. It's just nice to hear someone talking about the global situation. Um, I, I work at a botanic botanic garden, and uh, Europe in general has a, um, well, we, we basically pillaged the world for all the plant resources and animal resources for years, and we do have a responsibility to pay back somewhat globally um, for, for that period. Um, and also I, I reflect that one of the sort of three tenets of the European Green Deal is no person or place left behind. And so I think we really need to think globally as well. And it's, it's nice to hear that. That's what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. There was also a number of um, EU directives and regulations that are um, have been recently adopted that uh, essentially call for uh, this type of initiatives uh, at the European level, but even 
more so uh, globally, as you said. And so thanks for, for your involvement and contribution from uh, European institutions and, and researchers. Thank you. Thank you. So please go ahead and then. Yes, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, I think when you showed the, li the list of kind of use uh, uses, uh, to me, the one that really will have the biggest impact is really if we can integrate the use of this data in the reporting um, um, in, in the reporting cycle. Um, I mean, you said that CBD are involved, uh, UNCCD. So what is your, uh, you know, how, how enthusiastic are they, let's say, about making use of this really as the basis for reporting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, we we are uh, talking constantly with these secretariats uh, of, of the, the key Rio conventions. And of course, CPD is on board and they are the first and foremost, um, you know, interested stakeholder. But the, the others are also looking to, to find some uh, indicators, some key tools to support the reporting of their parties and uh, for instance for the UNF C for adaptation uh, there is a lack of indicators for uh, you know to measure what's happening uh, with uh, nature-based solutions and this could be a way for for these conventions to to promote a more um, quantitative approach to measuring and reporting on on certain aspects of the Paris Agreement, for instance, and so the other conventions. So it's really encouraging. Of course, there is a lot of um, uh, work to do. That's why we need to talk with the with the government. We keep engaging with them at the at every opportunity, including the subsidiary bodies of these conventions, and and we need your help also to to facilitate this. But yeah, there is uh, enthusiasm at least. Thank you. Last question by Christos, and then we continue. Yeah. Uh, th there are a lot of uh, global initiatives that, that can probably help uh, your, your target, to, to reach your target. I know that uh, in, uh, in the marine environment, there is this uh, World Ocean Assessment, which is carried out you know, every five years, if I remember well. Maybe uh, if you can build, you know, some kind of interface and and work with them, uh, then you can have you know mutual benefit, because these people are interested in in revisiting, uh, you know, the ecosystems and uh, making assessment as well. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. We, let's uh, exchange contacts, and uh, that's exactly the type of input we were looking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We uh, so if it's quick, if it's more, quick yeah. question. <clears throat> not sure it's quick. <laughs> no, it's a quick question. Um, just because I'm not an ecosystem expert, as you know, can you give some flavor of how much of the state is it just a matter of bringing data that exists together, or do you also need to develop new tools and methods to acquire data? So I'm not an ecosystem expert either, but apparently it's a really tough job, and we have had, uh, we had this couple of um, technical workshops with uh, with experts and they've been discussing forever how to do this because it's uh, methodologically not easy. Uh, there is some uh, agreement on uh, what the final outcome should be. So uh, an integrated map or a suite of maps that will you know make the digital compendium of the Atlas, but uh, uh, this integration is not easy. There is a lot of work that goes into vetting these maps. Um, you need to assess the uncertainties. You need to assess the, the data gaps or the overlaps. Uh, the, maybe there's too much data on on a certain you know type of uh, on a certain location. And how do you assess what what the best data is? So there's a lot of methodological issues that need to be resolved, and that's why we need to continue this design phase a little bit longer to to figure this out. And um, uh, but the, the the final the final outcome really should be a single reference framework, a single harmonized um, you know uh, type of you know atlas map um, for for the countries to use because they have too too much data, they have too much uh, information. 
So there's a need for substantial R&I investments as well. Definitely, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. If I may, or if I may, yeah. is it also an issue because you want global? That means all the countries in the in the world. Not all of them are easily give easily access to their data. I mean, if it's only satellite data, it's probably not such an issue. But you may also face the issue of getting data from from countries. Absolutely, yes. And we are learning from the you know, best practices that are out there. For instance, South Africa, they have um, long experience in um, developing national maps to monitor ecosystems, and they are, they've helped the neighboring countries to do so. And so we are building on that use case, for instance, and their experience to um, to expand this approach to the global level. And of course, in situ data will be hard to um, feed into the atlas, but we, we hope that you know eventually we have an ambitious you know goal uh, before us. But uh, we need to start with uh, with something big, otherwise we'll we'll fail with, before starting. Thank you very much. I think we need to proceed, and then we have an online presentation by Anne Teller, and it's on the Towards a European Biodiversity Monitoring Center. Hello, good uh, afternoon, everybody, and apologies for not being with you. So, in fact, um, the correct title could have been um, Towards a New uh, Biodiversity Knowledge Based Governance uh, at All Levels, because this is um, a discussion which is going on at the moment within the European Commission. Um, so, apologies if I, you know, um, moved a bit uh, the topic uh, as compared to what I, I was meant to provide. But um, as um, uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself for those who don't know me. Uh, I work for DG Environment in the European Commission, and I'm responsible for the strengthening of the knowledge base of the biodiversity policy at European and also global level. And uh, so here I will be the bad cop because I will um, voice more uh, the policy needs uh, because that's, uh, I think, something that we need really to consider in the future, that supply meets demands. And uh, so it's not knowledge for the sake of knowledge, data for the sake of data, but uh, the policymakers always uh, have um, specific um things to do and they need uh, they need uh, the best available information for that uh, and they don't necessarily get it so uh, on the other hand they get a lot of assessments and so and then they say you know the usual and so what uh, because it doesn't necessarily drives uh, direct policy action so that's what we have been trying to um, improve in the European Union and uh, Based on, on, on the very long uh, negotiations uh, on the global biodiversity framework um, at global level, then, uh, and, and a lot of decisions associated to it, we realize that uh, slowly, slowly, there is a system uh, which is being put in place um, at, um, at global level, which is rather similar to what uh, the climate policy is doing. And so, um, we thought, you know, it, it will be really important to be uh, fully equipped and to prepare for that because uh, um, we, we really need to make progress. I'm sorry, while I'm talking to you, I try to plug. A... Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Voila, sorry. My, my laptop was uh, nearly flat. Sorry for that. That should have checked before. is that we are now um, basically reporting, we have to report to the CBD Secretariat on uh, the alignment of our national or European strategy vis-a-vis -vis the global biodiversity framework with the 23 targets and also 
um, the indicators that we have for the monitoring framework, which has been adopted uh, together with the global biodiversity framework. And we are far from there. Um, we have a lot of progress to make, especially on the monitoring framework, because there, um, there are plenty of indicators which require not only uh, a lot of data, but also um, more science, you know, more and a better understanding of how to translate uh, the target into a meaningful indicator. We need more models as well. Uh, because some of the information can't be just uh, um, collected uh, from from the ground or from space uh, information. So uh, we need uh, to make scenarios to uh, to see whether you know we are on track or not, and be able during the whole ten year process to basically monitor progress or lack of progress and uh, report and review our implementation. So at European level, we have to synchronize um, the work so that we also have uh, our European indicators to track progress, uh, that the report we are providing also help um, ratcheting up ambition at European level. And uh, and then um, the big, the big uh, IBES assessment, which has now been uh, scheduled for 2028, which will be an assess global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I'm sure there will be useful synergies with the global atlas, which was just presented. So we were thinking of uh, delivering uh, the second EU ecosystem assessment just before, so that it, it could really contribute to the global assessment. And just parenthesis, um, in relation to uh, the previous presentation in the European Union, uh, the conceptual framework used is very much based on ecosystem ass ass assessment uh, standard, ecosystem accounting standard, sorry, because that's an international standard which has been adopted at UN level. And uh, so the definition of ecosystems, ecosystem extent, ecosystem condition, ecosystem services, um, uh, have been uh, defined internationally, and we believe it's important that U European Union uh, follows that. Now, um, what we need for that is really to strengthen uh, biodiversity knowledge uh, support service. And so we are supporting the development of a global one. We hope that it will be adopted at COP16 next year. But we also want um, to reinforce uh, an EU uh, biodiversity knowledge support service. And we see that uh, really as a service, that means that it should be a collective, um, a, a collective uh, initiative. Um, including, you know, all inclusive, if I may say so, whole of government, uh, whole of society. So uh, we need also to build on data uh, collected by citizen science, NGOs, uh, business, and vice versa to make access to the data to a wide community so that many uh, users um, can then uh, use the data for their own uh, scale and also for their own decision-making process, including business decision-making process. So that's what we have in mind. So we are um, uh, working on a biodiversity observation uh, service center platform network mechanism. Uh, the name hasn't fixed, been fixed yet, but we really want to have a a network of networks building also on member states and stakeholders uh, information and expertise. And uh, from what we heard from the member states is that they have a lot of data, but the data uh, is often not accessible. It's often not georeferenced and they don't necessarily have long-term trends, which are big hiccups. So um, uh, they, they were asking the commission uh, to help them by providing tools and solutions uh, in the first place to to make available the information that they have, to find a way to georeference their data as much as possible, and also um, to model some of the data so that um, we can have regular updates, yearly updates for uh, which is more 
synchronized to the uh, policy policy uh, cycle. So basically, data and service to support the whole planning, monitoring, reporting, and review cycle that has been uh, adopted at COP15 for biodiversity. So I think, um, and also having ensuring long-term funding because that's always uh, a very a very big um, uh, obstacle so i think with this i have uh, used a bit more than my seven minutes and uh, there will be side events at uh, the subsidiary body uh, substat 25 or in 10 days and also at COP, of course. So we will continue exchanging with you uh, all our developments and hope that uh, we will be able to create a real um, uh, network of networks uh, because uh, nobody is, is excluded on the country. We need everybody on board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if there is one urgent question, if not, we continue. Uh, next speaker is Michele Bresadola from Europe on telling us about the European uh, flagship on biodiversity, Biodiversa Plus. Thank you. Um... Is it working? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Michele Brazadola. I'm from URAC, but I'm today I'm here on behalf of Biodiversa Plus, and uh, I'll have a presentation of the achievement of uh, Biodiversa Plus towards a transnational network of national biodiversity monitoring schemes. Uh, I apologize, I will use the word biodiversity monitoring a lot in the next seven minutes. Um, first, what is Biodiversa Plus? Biodiversa Plus is a co-funded partnership by the European Commission. And it started in 2021, it will end in 2028. So we'll be here for seven years. It involves 80 partners from 40 different countries and has a budget of 800 millions over seven years, including both in-cash and in-kind contribution from the partners and 165 millions by the European Commission. Uh, one of the key aspects of Biodiversa Plus is, there is, is a network of national and subnational partners, and uh, it involves both the research actors in the form of ministries in charge of research and research funding organization, and the policy actors in the form of the Ministry of Environment and Environmental Protection Agency. So there is a comprehensive involvement of actors. Uh, one of the big activities uh, of uh, Biodiversa is the promotion and support on the launching of uh, research calls. So we had the three calls already launched. One is already up and running with 36 projects. There is a second one that is going to start uh, soon. And the third one that is open now, that is on biodiversity and natural-based solution, and it's open. So if you want to apply, feel free. But another big uh, activity of Biodiversa is promoting and supporting transnational biodiversity monitoring. So we try to build um, a biodiversity monitoring network, uh, be building on the existent uh, national and subnational actors involved in biodiversity monitoring. To do this, we need uh, different tasks. Of course, we need uh, to define priorities for biodiversity monitoring, and we have to support the harmonization of protocols and methods and database between different actors. Uh, we have to promote the use of novel technologies and citizen science. And of course, the use of biodiversity monitoring data to actually produce trends and uh, uh, understand the, the biodiversity dynamics that can support uh, actual policy decisions making. Uh, on top of that, we have also the launching of different biodiversity monitoring pilots, which are concrete ways to test these methods. And we will talk a bit about it later. So we're trying to build this network of national biodiversity monitoring schemes. 
Of course, there is also other strategies involved. Uh, involved. Uh, we talk about the priorities. We have also to provide new research for re resources for national biodiversity monitoring. Uh, this is done, for example, through the funding of the pilots or through the use of the European Commission top up, which is money that's used to valorize the current uh, biodiversity monitoring activity that the partners are carried out on their territory. Then there is the capacity building, the knowledge sharing and networking. So we organize different webinars and workshop and all kinds of events. And we try to so build a community. And then there is, of course, we engage with other relevant initiatives at the European level, such as Europa Bond or GB for GRC and many others. So we try to um, create a strategic framework that share a common vision on biodiversity monitoring at the European level. For example, to dive deep in the monitoring priorities, uh, we have to decide which are the priorities in our monitoring. So for the first two years, these were the eight priorities that we found out, and now they are 13 in total. So these priorities are aligns with the, with the actual monitoring that is being carried out by the partners are actionable. Uh, so they are linked to clear activities of uh, biodiversity monitoring and they are relevant for policy making and decision making processes. These priorities also uh, reflect in the sub pilots, which, as I said, are this concrete way to test the, um, the framework of the national biodiversity monitoring. So here there is actual monitoring involved. The people are actual sam uh, collecting samples. There are for every pilot uh, project, there is a coordinator and different partners that contribute from different countries to these sampling processes. Uh, three pilots were launched this year and three will be launched uh, next year. And uh, two of the pilots of this year were already extended to the next year to, pro um, to proceed with their work. The, the monitoring soil biodiversity pilot is coordinated by URAC. Of course, here you can see there is actual monitoring involved. So we are actually going into the field. And uh, so what we are trying to do is also to, to do this, to build this network, to support then the co-design and development of this BMCC. So this biodiversity monitoring coordination center, both at the European level with the help of Europa, like Europa Bonn is trying to do, but also to design there the national counterpart that we have to interface with this kind of institution. So we develop a phase one strategical document that describes the state of the art of biodiversity monitoring at the national and subnational level. And we will then develop a phase two document that will try to concretize all the elements that were listed in this report. Then, of course, uh, there are many, uh, there are several other publications that are available in the Biodiversa Plus library. They tackle many issues, many different aspects on the uh, harmonization of data, on the creation of the national uh, schemes, and uh, also on other topics like stakeholder engagement, funded opportunities, and nature-based solution. So all these elements uh, are uh, what Biodiversa is doing and much other stuff. And uh, these are key elements that try to mobilize the community to um, have uh, then a, a real network uh, and that involves all, um, all actors involved in biodiversity monitoring. And thank you. Questions, comments, we have time for one or two questions. So you have seen how diversified is the landscape of biodiversity studies, please. Hello, thank you for the presentation. A quick question. Would you foresee this national implementation coming through the partners at the national level of biodiversity, or would you also foresee some contribution from what we're discussing now? Or there's national coordination mechanisms for earth observation in the different countries. Um, for the national part, it's very difficult because of course uh, there is uh, uh, many, the, the countries are very different. 
So uh, what we are trying to do now is to assess the situation. And there are many opportunities uh, uh, the, where we can do this. But uh, I think that will be important to um, to address the difference in the in the countries that have many different layers and levels of this kind of uh, biodiversity monitoring methods and uh, governance model. So now for this, I had, I don't have an answer to this. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I've seen in your slides that the uh, habitat and the natural. Oh, excuse me. Habitat and the Natura 2000 uh, are different, are separated. Uh, habitat monitoring is one of the main uh, issue for uh, Natura 2000 uh, network. Why are separated? I, are you speaking about the protected areas and the habitat priorities, uh, right? I think, if uh, I understood correctly. Um, yes, there was so much thinking involved in that. and. Uh, uh, I think it was meant to to have a separation between habitat and protected areas because uh, we wanted to, to to keep them separated. I mean, to to have the priorities of habitats for as um, for for many kind of different habitats and the protected areas to aspect related, uh, especially for the protection. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we proceed. And now there is the first uh, round table. And I ask uh, Christos Arvanitidis to, to come here as a representative of LifeWatch, Eric, and Michel Breuer to come here as well as a representative of Anaï, Eric. And online, there is, you can see yeah, online. Uh, there is um, uh, Michael Milton as the representative of Elter RI, and I leave the floor to Guy Le Thank you very much. Um, so now we have a panel discussion, a short panel discussion of 20 minutes. So we have the speakers from the previous sessions. They um, elaborated on very interesting uh, international and European uh, initiatives. And now, indeed, these panelists uh, who joined us are representing some uh, European long-term research infrastructure. And um, we asked them, uh, well, all the panelists, by the way, to respond or to think on short response to um, these two guiding questions. So how to connect, and this is really the challenge, international European and national uh, initiatives and how Eurogeo can contribute to the GEO uh, post-2025 strategy and to provide actionable knowledge, and how long-term research uh, infrastructure can contribute to sustain biodiversity, ecosystem, and geodiversity monitoring across disciplines. So this is very ambitious. We know in uh, such a short time, but we will uh, do our best. So first, uh, I think I will give the floor to uh, Michael Myrtle, who is online. So Michael, can you hear us? And if yes, you have four minutes to try to answer as much as you can to uh, these or one of these questions. Okay, just for a sound check, can you hear me? Perfect. Well, and I think you can also see me. I can't see you, not entirely. Um, okay, so in very brief, uh, that's a mission impossible, but I will do my best to accomplish it. Um, to understand my statement, you have to know what we are. We are an ecosystem uh, research infrastructure. Uh, the key and unique characteristic is that we consider the system as a whole, from the geosphere through hydrosphere, biosphere, the social and economic sphere up to the atmosphere. We have about 200 sites in Europe that are true, that are real and operated in the long term. And the services comprise both access to these in situ research infrastructures to these 200 sites. But a key asset is that we carry out long term standard observation of the ecosystem, and that touches upon the key topic of this plenary geosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and the atmosphere. So, what we do comprises standard observation in these areas and we combine the data from that standard observations in the field 
with data from other sources like the remote sensing. So the integration between the in-situ and the remote sensing forms a key asset. Uh, now to the sustainability aspect. As you know, research infrastructures are long-term operated enterprises, and these enterprise, in the case of LTR, has two major branches. The one is the physical infrastructure in about 20 countries. We hope there will be even more, which are these sites, the 200 sites which are mentioned. The second big component are central services. These are what we call thematic service areas. They comprise, of course, all the data management and the integration, but you are asking for the actionable knowledge. So one of the seven thematic service areas of ELTA is synthesis analysis towards actionable knowledge. So uh, to get back to the key buzzwords of the session by diversity monitoring, we are securing, uh, you might call it a modest, but still a backbone of ELTA standard observations in the area of biodiversity that are in principle harmonized with major reference schemes. And the second asset is that we have a strong focus on mobilizing legacy data. Some of the sites of ELTA have been operated for more than 100 years, and we are putting a lot of investment in mobilizing, curating these long-term data series and make them accessible. As regards the contribution uh, to actionable knowledge provisioning via GEO, EuroGEO and related projects, we're engaging in several of the, the key projects, like for example, uh, eShape and the showcase on ecosystems. We engage in KLWell and ground truthing. We are providing our information from the information clusters where we ground truth and also provide in situ data. And we provide exploration and visualization tool, including a registry of about 1,200 places where also biodiversity monitoring is carried out worldwide. And besides from taking care of interfacing with decision-making through the own actionable knowledge service, uh, we of course contribute to everything GEO is doing on request through their own channels. And last but not least, a, a summarizing statement. Uh, from an RI perspective, we are really hampered that activities like in Biodiversa Plus are strongly related to the partnership, to the countries that are funding certain activities. And the European scale research infrastructure never has a 100% overlap between the funding partners in the partnership. Uh, so we are really constrained in carrying out research uh, infrastructure and network-wide activities that are compliant with the current status of the partnership. And um, my plea is that we would start a uh, discussion about that. Thanks. Thanks a lot for being short also. Really appreciate it. And now I will turn to um, Michel Boer for um, ANAE. So uh, the analysis and experimentation on ecosystem EU infrastructure. So Michel. Is yours. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit a bad guy because uh, I am not an observing person, but we are an experimental uh, infrastructure, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but we, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, to understand what uh, is going on on these uh, ecosystems and uh, what are the functions of the ecosystem. We have to observe them as well as making experimentation on, on them. Uh, so ANA uh, is uh, quite, I mean, as Anarik is young as an infrastructure, uh, has alway, already, I think, 10 to 15 years old. Uh, it's a distributed also infrastructure like Alger. We have uh, 60 uh, platforms on ecosystems. And what we are doing, it's really coordinated experiments across different climate and ecosystem uh, gradients. So meaning that we are making a lot of miseries to this ecosystem, draft, um, flooding, uh, type of uh, uh, heating the soil, things like that, to see how they will react to uh, so the, the anthropic uh, pressures. And at the same, uh, not at the same time, but we what we do also, uh, uh, we, we are uh, investigating uh, management practices uh, to see how we can uh, add, uh, help this ecosystem adapt to these uh, pressures. Uh, and which, uh, so it's really, so, uh, what we are doing is to really trying to forecast what will be the evolutions of this ecosystem under the atropic pressure, 
uh, and uh, what can be uh, their resilience and adaptation uh, possibilities. Uh, of course, some of the platforms are in the open air, so uh, with some biases due to that, and others are what we call the ecotrons, so they are enclosed where we have a large, of course, you have a large level of uh, uh, control, but at the expense of, uh, of uh, the uh, realism of the infrastructure. Uh, so we... Uh, we have also some, uh, uh, of course, analytic platforms, drones, aerial means, and I would say that, uh, of course, as I see, it, I mean, why I'm here is because we are experimental, and experimentation is a complement of, uh, is very complementary of observation. It's a kind of uh, uh, a double uh, spiral or double helix uh, between uh, the problems you have uh, on ecosystems comes usually from the observation and from the demand also of the society uh, to, uh, you, you're not a new problem, you want to solve it. Uh, so from the observation and modeling, you can have, uh, uh, you can already investigate how this ecosystem we have and will uh, evolve. And from the experimentation, you can uh, uh, accelerate this evolution. So seeing whether your, your hypotheses are valid and your models are valid or not. And then you, you, you have a double loop which normally should, uh, and it's where we, I think I, uh, we try to answer to your question is that uh, it's where uh, I think we, we, we can uh, help monitoring the, the biodiversity to, and monitoring the evolution of this uh, and to see how, uh, what will be the, land, the future uh, landscape. Um, I would say also that what is important and what we are trying to install, and I think we are working with that uh, with, uh, for the modeling uh, with LifeWatch, for the uh, observation uh, with Urger, with ICOS, with many infrastructures, uh, but also what is important is a multi-scale and we, uh, uh, we, we have platforms, but by definition you, you are um, uh, limited in size. Of course, you can go to Ultra, which is on the other side. It's a landscape scale, but then you have also to go to higher scales up to, the, of course, to the remote sensing from satellites and back, of course, because what you observe at remote sensing, of course, your pixel is not precise. You're observing from hundreds of kilometers. So you have also to make measures in situ, and this happens with one of our platform at OHP uh, it's a, it's a, uh, calibrating satellite observation. So I think that this two, uh, <clears throat> this two directionality is, is quite important uh, uh, for for the uh, future of uh, observations. Uh, and also, I would say uh, the link of One the minute. One oh, okay, yeah. I, I'm almost finished. So the link of the society, of course, we don't forget it. We have a network of. Uh, uh, 60 platforms, meaning uh, 60 locations where we can discuss with uh, the territory. So we cross the, uh, our scientific perspective with the territorial perspective. And uh, it's one of our uh, uh, axes of development. So we can make uh, uh, work uh, for agriculture, land management, tourism, etc. Et so uh, really in, uh, uh, what we call now the sustainable smart specialization uh, strategies. Uh, so I will maybe uh, uh, say, I think the message is the same, uh, at least with uh, Elter. Uh, first, the research infrastructure, we should not forget, it's a real strength. I, I don't think uh, they exist outside the EU, so this is very important. So you is able to have uh, an instrument, uh, which really, it's a long-term uh, instrument for observation, for experimentation, for knowledge on, on nature. Uh, uh, of course, also we are connecting nation, uh, naturally, since we are distributed, the local, the national, and the EU level. And of course, we are uh, discussing with uh, at upscaling at the international level, including uh, space and uh, but also other continents. And uh, I, I would mention the capacity building, which is very important for countries like Africa, but also uh, Latin America. Uh, and uh, as I said, there are also a lot of projects that are inter or transdisciplinary, 
uh, uh, we, we, we are uh, together with uh, LifeWatch, we are uh, in AgroServe, which is agroecological transitions, but also in IRIS, so the impact of climate risk, in uh, aqua, the aquaculture and fisheries, and uh, the impact mm -hmm. of particles and uh, the biodiversity from microbial to ecosystems. So I think there are a lot of uh, things that are very useful in the EU uh, landscape. Thank you Thank very you much. much. I know I know it's it's challenging, but hopefully you will have time to discuss afterwards. So now we go back to research with um, Christos and uh, LifeWatch Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. Um, well, I think that uh, Michael and Michelle uh, they 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 said you know most of the story, and uh, therefore I'm lucky because I have you know to speak much less. <laughs> anyway, I'll try you know to bring uh, w w what is missing you know from the picture. The functional, first of all, life, which is uh, the um, uh, European research infrastructure uh, that offers the e-science uh, infrastructure on biodiversity and ecosystem research. Uh, as a research infrastructure, so we are not actually doing research. We develop, you know, the tools to facilitate those who are doing research. And that has to do with the first, uh, actually, <clears throat> question, how to connect uh, international, European, and national levels. Uh, the functional elements of any research infrastructure uh, are, uh, first of all, fair data. Um, the second is um, um, the reproducible analytics. And the third one are, is the mobilized communities. So because uh, as uh, uh, a bunch of, of uh, research infrastructures that we all deal with biodiversity, for example, NIA, for example, ELTR, DISCO, EMBRC, et cetera. Uh, we can cite you know, a few more. Uh, I think that we have the capacity to mobilize communities at the European level that they can go you know, down to national level, but even you know, more down to local level or regional level. So, uh, if we have consolidated targets, uh, then I think that we all have, you know, uh, the mechanisms uh, to uh, make this uh, connection between the levels. Um, uh, for example, Enrique was uh, was reporting, you know, the reports of uh, Europa Bond. That's an excellent, you know, uh, example of a mechanism how to do that. <clears throat> um, on the other side, um, yeah, how we can. Uh, uh, UGO can contribute, you know, to the GEO post-2025 strategy. Um, the, actionable, the actionable knowledge comes from the fact that uh, the people achieve after a while, you know, certain targets, certain objectives, and therefore uh, they can sit, you know, um, down and, and they can find, you know, the next challenges. And I think through those next challenges, uh, we, we can, uh, you know, contribute uh, to the um, uh, actionable uh, knowledge uh, for which we have, you know, all of course, we need, you know, to commit ourselves. Um, how we can contribute uh, to sustain biodiversity ecosystem and uh, uh, geodiversity monitoring across the disciplines? Well, I'll tell you this. We don't have, you know, any problem at the technical level. We don't have any problem at the scientific level. Uh, at the European level, at least, we have very good teams. Uh, and uh, they have all reported, you know, back to the EUGO. Uh, I see Kentin, I see Saverio, I see many of my colleagues, you know, in this room, for example. Uh, they brought up, you know, very uh, uh, good examples of how this can be done. The major problem is uh, the social. We don't speak, you know, the same language, and this is very difficult to break, because through the language we can break the barriers uh, between the disciplines and between the domains. One way we try to do that is uh, through the EUS platform, uh, where we create the technology to do that, and therefore to un unite uh, the uh, data the services, but also any other research products across the disciplines and the, the scientific domains. And I think that's, that concludes you know, my reply. Thank you. Thanks a lot. 
And now I'd like to turn to um, Sarah and to Anne um, to check if they have something to comment on on the basis of what has been said. And also what you think about indeed this specificity of the EU having this long-term uh, European research infrastructure that could also be a backbone into um, articulating some of the activities maybe on uh, um, biodiversity monitoring. Yeah, thank you, Gail. Um, I would like to add to what has been said, uh, especially with regard to the possible contribution of the Eurogeo community to the post-2025 geostrategy, um, leveraging this power that, the, that Europe has in terms of long-term infrastructure and research. In fact, um, a very practical suggestion. Uh, on the on one hand, funders like the European Commission or European Space Agencies and others could and should make sure that these initiatives are connected um, when they issue calls for proposals. So they mention in the in the text of the you know calls of the tenders that these initiatives should indeed be connected. And this is already happening. I know that um, an ESA tender coming out next week, uh, in the coming weeks, in fact, um, about um, global ecosystem dynamics that is aimed at um, supporting a series of open uh, knowledge tools to monitor ecosystem will definitely mention the Geo Atlas and, and all the other relevant initiative and trying to make these connections from the start so that these tools that migrate when they're mature, they migrate into the Atlas and live longer and contribute to this earth intelligence that we're talking about for the post-2025 strategy. On the other hand, the, the proponents of, the, of these initiatives, of these um, projects, should really try to make these connections on their side to look at what's already out there and try to aim high, um, look at the uh, initiatives in GEO, look at the emerging um, global frameworks and make sure that this connection exists, that they're not just doing research for the sake of research, but really responding to the policy needs, as uh, Anne told us, uh, that they're trying to, in fact, uh, fill those gaps and bridge those um, communities. So that's my, my suggestion. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And maybe Anne, you want to comment on that also? Yes, just a moment. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. I think the the, the key words uh, have been pronounced. Huh? It's, uh, as I said, what we hear from member states is that uh, they really need infrastructures. You know, they really need um, tools. They need uh, also uh, trainings or expertise to help them improving what they have. I think that's... Uh, that's their first priority before adding uh, new elements in whatever monitoring system. They first would like to better um, profile and use uh, what they have and share that so that it could be integrated uh, into different types of uh, assessments. The second uh, key word is connect. Um, we need to connect all these initiatives, of course, but we also need to connect science and policy and make sure that supply meets demand because there, there are clear demands from the policy side. And uh, we really need to, to look at it carefully and see how best uh, we can um, supply what is needed to um, monitor progress, to set up um, quantify targets at any level to um, build meaningful indicators, um, to be able to um, develop scenarios on, you know, what, uh, how, what the situation could be in 10 years time, different options, what uh, and where um, best to act in priorities. It's very important to have this uh, spatial dimension and I'm very happy that it was mentioned by uh, most of the uh, uh, speakers today because um, it's really important to, uh, 
to consider uh, the location of actions because biodiversity is really um, um, be, um, com completely related um, to spatial planning. And so um, it, it's not uh, like climate change, which is a more global issue. So um, we what um, we would like to do is really to um, sit down all, all the willing, you know, and to have a coalition of the willing and see how we could improve what we have already and then fill the gaps, which is, of course, uh, a, a big, uh, a big challenge. But uh, that's something we will we will need to address at, at some stage. So thank you for all these very good food for thought today. Thank you, Anne. I see, uh, Michael, that you want to take the floor. Maybe I will turn towards the, the room before to see if I can take one question. I know that we are exceeding the time, but just maybe to see if there is one question in the room, one comment to what has been said. No. Oh, perfect. Then, uh, Michael, I can give you the floor then. Are you muted? Sorry. Uh, what I want to raise is maybe the point of, of view of, of a quite big group that just tries to make it happen. We have seen so many concepts, so many overarching concepts, so many initiatives. And from our perspective, uh, the current challenge is about a division of tasks. And when I say we are trying to establish a backbone of biodiversity monitoring at 200 sites, you might smile, that's nothing. Uh, that's a, a drop on the hot stone. On the other hand, a division of task could be that, that we at least roll out a basic set of biodiversity monitoring variables, that we use this backbone, which has the advantage of being funded in the mid and long term, for example, also for testing and rolling out further methods. And I think what we are lacking is this, uh, focus on what's already existing and what advantage we can take from ongoing activities like the establishment of emerging research infrastructure like ELTA. What we observe is again and again initiatives, while maybe uh, it's, it's more attractive to start new initiatives than to take full advantage of what's already existing and on track. Thank you. Well noted, and I, I think we have to close the panel. Uh, it could continue, I know, and I hope that you will have side discussions uh, this evening. Uh, now we have to to pass to the second part of the discussion. Thank you very much. So we now have uh, two short uh, panel discussions on more scientific and operational challenges. So I, I ask uh, Sophie Justice, coordinator of the European Geoparks Network, uh, Alberto Bassett uh, from University of Salento, also LifeWatch, Eric, uh, ZB Zwolinski from the Adam, that means the Mikiewicz University in Poland, and Edita Wozniak from CBK PAN. So the point, the first question is that, I mean, in the, in the old world of, uh, Tansley, ecosystems are the living organisms together with their physical, chemical, and geological environment. So it, it's, it's a whole system, as it was said also before. So we have challenges in, in, in putting together data, information, knowledge from geodiversity, biodiversity ecosystems. And so I, I ask, in, each of the panelists in three minutes, because then it, it, will, it will be open the, the, the hole with the crocodiles there, as we said the other day, um, to answer what, how to cope with this challenge and how to make the, uh, the knowledge actionable. And I will start with uh, ZB. Yeah, we have a few slides there. I have two points. Oh, uh, uh, not that. For discussion, not. Uh, 
the first point is uh, about uh, special scale in assessing uh, geodiversity. Uh, I prepared the table uh, with uh, some data and depends on uh, size of the area which we assess, uh, we can uh, adjust uh, uh, special scale. And on the first column, you have uh, landforms from microforms, for example, uh, one square meter up to continental scale or global scale, geomorphic realm. And for that uh, ranking of landforms, uh, I distinguish uh, few sizes. It is in the, not last, but before last the column, cell size, uh, which are connected with the um, procedure of uh, assessing geodiversity. The smallest one is the half of centimeter, and the biggest one is the five kilometers. The second point, the second point is connected with the uh, combining uh, biodiversity and geodiversity in one map. On the left side is a map of geodiversity created on the basis of the geomorphological map, lithological map, uh, hydrological elements, and soils. Uh, on the other side, uh, right side, is the biodiversity map created on the two uh, factors. I mean um, natural vegetation uh, created uh, on the basis of field mapping, and the second map is the uh, potential uh, vegetation created uh, according to uh, mapping of uh, habitats. And when we overlay these two maps, we uh, obtain uh, the final very detailed map of geodiversity and biodiversity map. And here is the very low uh, geodiversity and very low biodiversity. On the end, we have a uh, mark of uh, very high geodiversity and uh, very high biodiversity. When we reclassify this uh, legend, we obtain nine or three uh, legends uh, with uh, low, medium, and uh, very high geodiversity. Thank you. So if you think that monitoring biodiversity is complicated, monitoring biodiversity and geodiversity is even more complicated. That's the message, uh, uh, right? And then especially because it's a matter of space and time scale, which can be very different. Uh, next three minutes, Sophie, just, uh, Sophie Justice, still on, 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 on geodiversity and biodiversity. Thank you very much, Antonello. Um, I too have a few slides, please. Um, I'm afraid for the people who didn't join our action group yesterday, um, I gave examples yesterday of concrete ways in which um, protected and managed areas were actually using this type of information and why it is actually important to us. So I'm talking to you today as an end user, not just an end user, but as a group of 98 end users. Um, UNESCO Global Geoparks are present in 28 European countries um, and um, we cover areas of about 1,000 to, to 3,000 square kilometres and we have obligations in conserving and managing natural heritage, global natural heritage um, and also long-term sustainable development. And so what actually, I was given three topics to talk on and um, for me, what is really important as an end user is being able to end up with a view and with information and data that I can use that is actually transdisciplinary, properly transdisciplinary. At the moment, what comes down to me on the ground is biodiversity, full stop, whether it's in policy, whether it's in regulation, but in practice, it's the only signal that comes through 
And it's the only one that my decision makers listen to, and it's the one that my funders listen to. So for me, what would be really important is being able to open this up because we know that the earth is a series of systems and they interact. And we need to be able, or what should I say, people on the ground need to be able to use this information. And if you look at myself and the, net, the other geoparks that I represent, we all are faced with the same challenge, no matter which country we're in in Europe. So in terms of needs, um, for me, I need to move away from single notions, biodiversity, geodiversity. We need to understand the relationships between them, but we need to look on a, on a more uh, uh, integrated basis. Maintaining the top-down, bottom-up approaches would reassure me a lot. Um, satellite data and imagery is incredibly powerful, but we also need to remember um, that a lot of these systems are quite complicated. There are a lot of drivers and pressures acting on these systems at the moment, and they may not quite act the way we expect them to. There need to be long-term observations, the ones that are already underway and new ones to fill the gaps in the different data sets that we don't have. Um, I've been completely overwhelmed at this meeting in just seeing the amazing collection of data and the number of studies that are underway. Um, so definitely pulling on the existing data. As far as the question of geodiversity is concerned, we clearly have an issue of scale. We need to understand what are the relevant scales to be working on and the systems. Uh, geodiversity is very much a system-driven um, uh, phenomena and we mustn't forget the human side of this. Humans today are a massive driver on our environment. And then uh, the last point is to be able to provide research out output to territories like my own and other, other protected and managed areas. So to bring it to a close from a perspective point of view, if we're able to do this, then we absolutely can provide improved natural diversity management. We can deliver these things greater protection of nature, regeneration of natural habitats, but also development and adaptation in the face of, of climate change and improve resilience to natural hazards for, for our whole environment and, and humans uh, as well. From a sustainable development point of view, we also need this information for informed land use choices. Um, Organisations like myself are asked for opinions about uh, new planning policy about major infrastructure and having a having a proper understanding of how geodiversity and biodiversity work together the scale they work on means that I'm actually able to give go back and give the right decisions to the national authorities and the other agencies so thank you very much now is the turn of Alberto Bassett for a But uh, I can start uh, because uh, uh, the point I'm touching is uh, uh, how can we connect uh, through uh, major scientific issue and uh, scientific question, which relevance is going beyond science uh, and is going to affect uh, the society and the policy. So uh, if we, I don't know if, okay, if we uh, go and see the mission of life, which uh, is uh, building services in order to deepen our understanding on the mechanism which are organizing biodiversity and biodiversity maintenance uh, and on the constraints that are behind this mechanism and are setting then the real value of biodiversity that we observe a single ecosystem or, st or studying area. Well, and this component is affecting ecosystem functioning and services and these constraints are deeply rooted on the geodiversity. And then we are considering this connection at the moment, uh, only in part for some aspect of geodiversity that is dealing with uh, the soil uh, characteristic or the hydrology characteristic, much less at the moment for the others. But the impact of this uh, understanding is of course uh, quite relevant at all level. And we have an example on what are the thematic services of life watch, because there is at least, well, all of them are basically related on the connection between the biodiversity ecosystem and uh, geo 
diversity, but there is particularly one, biodiversity and ecosystem responses to climate change that are dealing with uh, so large issues, as we can say, the uh, carbon storage or the adaptation to climate change, where we have uh, quite strong evidences uh, on the individual level response uh, to climate change, particularly for the aquatic ecosystem. And we also have uh, an, um, a strong theoretical connection and support that allow us uh, to have the cascading effect on the individual response uh, on the population dynamic response and the ecosystem the ecosystem services response. And we have also data about that. We can make estimate on the overall energetic metabolic cost uh, from today up to 200, uh, uh, 2,100 uh, in terms of 10%, 15%, 20% of increase. And then we have uh, uh, data on the latitudinal scale that tell us how much uh, the average individual size of marine species are decreasing, uh, whatever is uh, the level of taxonomy. And then we have also some projections that are going to say that uh, uh, we are going to lose uh, in river basin more or less 20% of net primary production. That is an impact on our economics. That is an impact on not only on, service, on ecosystem service, but on our use of ecosystem service. Of course, there's a, a large uncertainty around this number because there are either modeling or estimate. We need to deepen this and to cover this gap using the services and the virtual research environment that we can offer in order to have then specific case, we can have more detailed component of uh, to what extent even the geodiversity is affecting, favoring or contrasting the ecosystem response and biodiversity response to climate change. And the very last point is not is something more than having something together in terms of, of addressing scientific questions that are are most relevant for our society, but that we can also have a co-construction process. So what I will say that we can co-construct the services that are needed in order to address this point and also improve uh, our harmonization and interoperability service that we have at the moment uh, altogether merging the two communities. Thanks so much. Thank you, Alberto. So I ask Edith Wozniak to come here and to give a remote sensing perspective. Okay, it will be remote sensing. May I ask for my presentation? It will be a remote sensing perspective, but mainly in the context of the end user the perspective. I would like to present a, a example of our re recent relation with Campinas National Park, which is willingness to use the remote sensing data from the assessment of a high geo and biodiversity which they have in the park, which is undergoing very uh, huge human pressure because they are, as a national park, they are uh, located next to Warsaw, so two million people. I don't want to say that two million people visit it every day, but exert the uh, pressure over it. So uh, taking into account the geo biodiversity, uh, we have to, from the perspective of our um, stakeholder, which is National Park, we have to think about also the uh, conservation philosophy. All, three, uh, all these three aspects have different meanings depending where we are and what we, what we want to do. Mm. Uh, and also what is important from the uh, conservation philosophy is that uh, there are mainly four kinds of the uh, philosophies, but the users of the area can have completely different point of view, and we have to manage all of these three aspects. So I will give some main examples from the park, the most important things which they want to do. Uh, and what they are talking about. The park is under very huge human pressure and under climatic change. And the problem which we have seen in the use of the remote sensing data is the problem of the observability and the operationality of the solution which you can uh, provide. First of all, the question is if the phenomenon which we are, are we able to observe uh, with our spatial and uh, 
temporal resolution of our data, the phenomenon, which want to, which have a specific size and dynamic. Another thing is what do we really see with observe with our sensor, and that were the questions of our end user. Apart from that, is the question about the technical capacities which is needed and common understanding of the pro uh, of the product which will be delivered, and obviously cost. And I will give three examples first the human pressure and the urbanization of the urban zone um, and the invasive species obviously it will be relatively easy to take high resolution data from satellites or drone and perform the uh, um, analysis for the park but it's not feasible from the economic point of view so we have to try to use the freely available data to do that. And it's still possible to uh, deliver the product at the accurate way, but uh, to be able to do it regularly as the monitoring, we need automatic uh, development uh, to, to develop automatic tools to make the park independent from us. And another thing is what about the monitoring under tree canopy in this case, which is quite limited. And another thing was the related to climate change and climate of uh, what uh, regime of surface water and soil moisture. So for herbaceous areas of the park, we can solve it with Sentinel-1 data uh, to certain extent, but um, uh, once again, the question about the monitoring under tree canopy. So we are waiting uh, very, with a lot of hopes of rose emissions, we and the park, of course. So the main conclusion of this relation with the park was how to uh, answer uh, for the needs of the stakeholders in the context of the, our limitation of observability and operationality. Thank you very much. So basically, when we do our research, we, we need to take into account societal and user needs and requests at the same time to be aware of the knowledge gaps and how to fill them when possible, right? And, and, and so these, and also to have a whole system approach because everything is, I mean, not everything, but many things are connected and we cannot uh, stay too much isolated. Questions, comments, uh, we have time for one or two questions or comments, otherwise we go to the second and last panel discussion. Comments, questions? All right, so thank you very much. And then, thank you. So I, I ask uh, uh, Anna Lillebo, uh, Anna Spinoza, and Eduardo Cremonese to come here. Anna Lillebo from Aveiro University, Anna Spinoza del Tales, Eduardo Cremonese from Chima Research Foundation. and. Here it's another interface, another challenge between water and ecosystems. I mean, Europe has been subject to droughts or floods and, and wetlands are particularly exposed to that, but also mountains have been very exposed to that. We had a, 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 an interesting seminar before in the in previous session. So I would start with the, uh, Anna Spinoza. Yep. Anna, uh, if we can change it. Yep. I will uh, start in the meantime, yes. Uh, well, actually talking about like what the challenges and means that the interface is quite difficult in three minutes. Uh, I think if we want to strive for uh, if we want to summarize everything, what we want to strive for is to establish an integrated uh, knowledge sharing ecosystem uh, and to address both coastal and environmental uh, challenges in a collaborative way. So we have touched upon uh, several of these uh, uh, topics already, but what we will really need is to work in an integrated framework, which means also understand each other language and harmonize the architecture, uh, look for a better coordination. So promote collaboration, communication, and really try to reduce all the duplication and fragmentation that we have uh, sometimes. 
And another topic that of relevance would be really to promote bottom-up approach also, as Sophie was mentioning before, uh, but really making sure that stakeholders and users are fully involved in the decision-making and in the knowledge generation, but also look for long-term sustainable uh, solution. And we have discussed uh, quite a lot about this, also like embracing new capabilities uh, uh, and digital services like the digital twins. So I, I would like here to give an example of how we are trying to uh, make this uh, interface possible between land and sea. In February next year, we will start a new project. It's called Land Sea Lot. And the main objective of the, process, of the project is to uh, assess all the gaps in the observation at land sea interface. And what we're gonna do is to uh, really look uh, at three main categories of societal challenges, which include, for example, the preservation of uh, biodiversity and decrease of pollution. And in order to do that, we uh, define nine uh, integration labs and we brought together uh, people from Jericho, Danubius and ICOS research, research infrastructure in order to make sure that the different uh, communities uh, belonging to the different networks start to communicate to each other and to really assess what are the needs between the integration of uh, the marine environment and the fresh water. Uh, we are going to cover the different European uh, uh, regional water bodies, and uh, we will invest also quite some time in uh, uh, capacity and uh, training of stakeholders and users because we are going to, the idea is to cover the gaps with uh, local sensors and citizen science. And I also wanted to uh, like touch upon some of the difficulties that we are having in the models. Uh, we are working in the Edito Model Lab to uh, develop the next generation of uh, ocean medical model. And what we are doing is to really try to understand how can we move or uh, enhance the model that we, we already have from global ocean. So all these uh, scaling uh, difficulties that were mentioned also in the session before, and really looking on how can we make all the models communicate? How can we integrate the reverse input and the atmosphere input? together with observation that are of course used to calibrate and validate the, the model. And if uh, artificial intelligence can in any any how uh, make the models more efficient. So here are like all the different components that we are trying to integrate to, to each other and making the models communicate is also quite, uh, quite tough. And this was my last slide, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I also ask if it's possible to share the presentation. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm here um, also as coordinator of the Restores for C project that I had the chance also to present as a poster. And some of you are partners of uh, uh, this project. And uh, I would like to talk about these challenges between the water uh, the interface between the water and the ecosystems, but also relate a little bit with the Restores for Seas project. Although most of these challenges, as we saw, uh, as we have been listening on temporal and spatial scales or the science policy interface, they are cross-cutting. So just, sorry, just an overview of the project. This is the consortium, the Restores for Seas stands for Modeling Restoration of Wetlands for Carbon Pathways. And here it's quite important because we are dealing with wetlands and most wetlands, we don't know, for instance, the fluxes for greenhouse gases emissions. So there is a lot of information regarding carbon stocks, but um, to, to understand and to be able to, to monitor and to have decision making based on the total, uh, the, the, the carbon cycle, uh, we need to know the carbon fluxes and uh, especially the greenhouse gases emissions. And in this case, the potential of wetlands for the abatement of these emissions. So linking to uh, restoration of wetlands. And then of course, to climate change mitigation and adaptation, ecosystem services, biodiversity, uh, uh, co-benefits. We have a safe case pilots all in coastal areas. So we are addressing climate change, 
biodiversity loss and habitat degradation. We are addressing by comparing uh, reference sites with restored sites and uh, impacted sites so we can really see the difference on these carbon pathways and co-benefits. And then for the co-benefit for the sustainable management of wetlands. But about the challenges, as has also been man uh, mentioned, the land sea continuum and the special scales. This is really one of the challenges is to integrate the information because we are dealing with coastal wetlands, but of course you have all the effects from the catchment areas, but also so upstream downstream effects but you also have downstream, upstream, if we see, if think about sea level rise or extreme events, uh, saltwater intrusion. So we have uh, in these coastal areas, the, it's very important that we integrate for this land, sea, and uh, uh, aquatic realms continuum. But also has been mentioned, and I'm sorry, there is some strange uh, things there, but it has to be with the processes. It's the flow of ecosystem services. So the demand side of uh, ecosystem services, which can be from the um, human drivers, which are reflected on the human drivers of ecosystems of the change, but also and the ecosystem functions. So we have the supply side and the demand side, it can be, we heard about the policy demand side, but also uh, the benefits from these ecosystem services. So to understand these flows are very important on the social ecological perspective. These questions are still, are still uh, timely because uh, we need to know, and in this case, apply to the carbon uh, cycle, if they are wetlands are still in good shape for delivering these ecosystem services, namely, uh, namely on the carbon cycle, then it's how we can value, because we in this project, it's a transdisciplinary approach. We would also like to express and showcase the cost effectiveness of restoring these ecosystems. And of course, also uh, know the, the drivers of change that can diminish or enhance the deliver um, the, the, these ecosystem services. But again, we have, we can have here a challenge on ecosystem service across multiple scales. If we restore wetlands, if we do have the carbon sequestration and abatement of greenhouse gases emissions, of course, these benefits go beyond the area of the wetland. Um, and uh, there can also be a mismatch between the ecosystem area as uh, an ecological perspective, but also the policies that are managing. And we ha can have transboundary uh, um, policies. We can have other um, uh, mismatch between the, the different scales. So it's also important that we consider all the different scales of supply side and demand side. So what we are doing, we are gathering the information on the ecosystems, on the social perspective, the uh, mapping, the te more technological perspective on the mapping and modeling tools, the, also the economics and financing, also with the community of practice so that we want to upscale this information to the wetland side, but then contribute to the being integrate to be policy relevant in the perspective of the climate and biodiversity policies, the Green Deal, and of course, the land use, land change and forestry uh, regulation uh, in this integrated matter. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Eduardo Cremonese on a different environment. Thank you very much for being here for the very last uh, presentation of this very long day. Uh, Antonello asked me if you can start the presentation. Thank you. Antonello asked me to give the perspective of the mountain environment. We tend to see mountains as uh, the water towers of uh, the lowlands. So this connection between the mountains and the lowlands, we provide water to everyone more or less. But uh, we are starting to witness the effect of drought also in the mountains. And how can we look at it from the perspective of the interface uh, of biodiversity and water cycle? Uh, this is the example of two very different ecosystems in very similar climate. And the red arrow show the difference of the water balance. So one perspective to link uh, biodiversity and the water cycle could be 
the different functional properties of the ecosystem. And this is a huge knowledge gap. We still don't know which will be the evapotranspiration scenarios in the mountains and how this will affect the local water cycle and then the discharge that we provide to the lowlands. So this is a very relevant point of research and uh, things that need to be uh, studied more. But then it's not only natural natural ecosystem. We have this interface within the agro ecosystem, for example, uh, pasture and uh, agriculture, mountain agriculture. So uh, the impact that this interface has on socio ecological system is very relevant. Here, here you have the increase of the irrigation water requirement of 2022 summer drought that we had in Europe. So you had this very strong increase of water demand from the mountains and still there was this connection with the lowlands that need to be uh, fulfilled. So the topic uh, touches upon very different aspects that we have discussed so far today. And my last point is uh, this uh, holy grail uh, of the actionable knowledge. So how can we move to a very nice model that integrates remote sensing, field observation models, and we estimate uh, the water demand into local policies to help farmers to produce good uh, cheese. So how can we do this? Uh, I think we will agree on the fact that, uh, sorry, we need to put our hand on the science policy interface. Uh, it's, we, we tend to say this a lot, it's not very simple. It's time consuming. We need to build a common language. And as from the scientific community, we need to be very well aware of how the policy cycle works. This is our, these are my two cents. It does not, it's not sufficient to think that we produce very good actionable knowledge without knowing how the policy cycle works and where we can put this knowledge in order to have an impact on local, regional, global communities. This is my last recommendation for the very last talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>